Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. We come to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that continues to thrive here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society. Tonight, I'm pleased to host Craig Fairman to talk with us about US presidents and the books they wrote. I'm also joined by AAS Director of Book History, Kevin Wisniewski. Before introducing tonight's guest, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening and for newcomers here to tell you a little bit about the American Antiquarian Society. We were founded in 1812 by printer Isaiah Thomas. AAS is a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're devoted to understanding and sharing the history and culture of North America before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, the graphic arts, and print ephemera. In addition to this virtual program, we offer a variety of other public programs. We have visiting research fellowships, and we welcome scholars and readers from around the world to use our reading room to work with our collections on your own research projects. And I'm delighted to say we are once again welcoming readers by appointment. Particularly relevant to tonight's program, the American Antiquarian Society is a hub for the history of books and reading in America. Our program in the history of the book in American culture, now four decades old, has sponsored symposia, summer seminars, and currently a monthly virtual book talk series the last Thursday afternoon of each month. Researchers find in our collections extraordinary materials for studying the publishing, distribution, and consumption of all sorts of printed materials. We're happy to present programs like this one free of charge, though of course running them isn't without expense. If you wish to help support programs like this one, a link to AAS's giving page will be available in the chat. Before I introduce tonight's guest, Kevin will offer a quick overview on the platform we're using for this program. Kevin? Thank you very much, Scott, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. For tonight's uh, program, we'll be using Zoom webinar. And there are two features that I'd like to highlight for you. First, we'll be using the dedicated Q&A feature, not the chat box, for the Q&A portion of the program. By using the Q&A function, we'll be better able to keep track of the questions. You can place your questions in that Q&A at any point during the program. Uh, and this feature also has an option to upvote questions so that if someone posts a question that you'd want to see discussed, uh, you can vote it up to the top of the queue. Due to the large number of attendees tonight, the chat box will be used only for informational purposes. Throughout the program, I'll be posting relevant links and information there. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can contact us as presenters in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to save the chat and retain uh, links for future use, you can save a transcription by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. Finally, we are recording this program and we will make it available on our website and YouTube channel for future viewing. Scott, back to you. Thanks, Kevin. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight. Craig Fairman's book, Author in Chief, The Untold Story of Our Presidents and the Books They Wrote, appeared in 2020. And he followed it up with an, with an anthology also published by Simon & Schuster entitled The Best Presidential Writing from 1789 to the Present. Craig has also written about non-presidential books and ideas, including How Ohio Shaped Toni Morrison's Fiction in the Cincinnati Magazine, and a profile of Stephen Greenblatt for the Boston Globe, among others. He's coming to us tonight from his home in Bloomington, Indiana. Craig, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, it's, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with you telling our viewers a bit about Author in Chief, what they'll find in the book, what got you interested in the presidents and their books, and the sorts of research you did to discover this history. Sure. 
before I do that, I want to thank you and Kevin and everybody else at AAS, not just for hosting this event tonight, which I've been looking forward to for quite some time, but also for the help you guys did behind the scenes with, with my book and with my research. It's no surprise that, you know, you guys helped me find images and answer important questions and, and your archivists there are top notch. But the thing that always sticks out to me is when I was putting together the images for the book, there's a lot, as we'll talk about tonight, there's a lot about presidents, but there's a lot about literature and literary history too. And I really wanted to highlight this board game, which was really popular in the mid 19th century called Authors. And, and it was basically like Go Fish there. It's actually mentioned in Little Women. So it was a really big game at the time. And you guys still have copies of the cards and the boxes and everything. And so I asked to, to get a picture of that and, and everyone worked with me. But then as I was looking at the cards, I was like, well, it's great that we can see the authors on the cards, but I talk so much in my book about Washington Irving and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Is there any chance they're in the deck of cards? Could we like redo the photograph so the, the cards in the picture lined up better with this authors in the book? And, and I almost didn't send this email because I was like, this is such a small thing that I really shouldn't pester them. They've got so much to do. But immediately the archivists and, and the photographers were like, that's a great idea. We'd be happy to do it. And so the fact that you guys have this material and that you share this material with researchers and, and with everyone else, uh, you know, as, as somebody who cares a lot about American history, it means a lot to me. And I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you. That that's what we're here for, and we're just so delighted to to have been of assistance to you in this great project. Well, well, thank you, um, Kevin. If you want to put the first slide up, um, I'll talk a little bit, sort of give an overview of the book, and then we can we can talk about more specifics. Um, so I'm somebody who is really interested in in just the history of things. I, I often find myself asking, well, you know, if something's happening, if something's interesting in the news or in my life, what's the history here? How has that happened before? And, and this first image is actually an example. It, it's the history of what we're doing right now. We're here talking about books. And although it feels very 2021, especially because we're doing it virtually, uh, there, there's a past to it. This is an image of Charles Dickens doing one of his book events in America in the mid 19th century. And it's not that different than what we're doing uh, tonight. He would walk out on stage. He would read from his book. He would take questions and, you know, pretty much anything that you're interested in, there's a history. And I often find it really illuminating, not just to learn about the history, but also how better understanding that history helps us better understand things in the present. So that's just kind of how my mind works. And as you'll see in the next slide, um, that was also sort of what prompted this uh, book project. So in 2008, I was in graduate school and I was supposed to be reading, you know, Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe and things like that. But what I was really reading is what you'll see on your screen, <laughs> which is what Politico looked like way back uh, in the 2008 version of the Internet. And I just was really excited about that election. It was an exciting election for everyone. But, but one thing that really stuck out to me was that it was an election where books really seemed to matter. John McCain had best-selling books. Hillary Clinton had best-selling books. And of course, the best example of all was Barack Obama, whose books were really hard to separate from his rise. It's, you know, it sort of felt like the candidate, the book, the, the campaign, the excitement, they all melded into one um, really powerful force. And so I just found myself wondering, like I said, is there a history to this? Is this the first time a book has been so influential in a campaign and, and something that so many Americans cared about? And I started digging around and, and quickly realized there had not been any other books written on this topic and, and not even much in, in periodicals or academic journals or, or anything like that. And so I just started out by making a list. And you'll see on the next slide that what I realized is that this history, this history of presidents writing books is really as old as American history itself. Um, I divided things into two categories. And I mean, it's hard to come up with categories for things like Herbert Hoover's mining textbook or Jimmy Carter's revolutionary war novel. Um, but you know, if we're gonna speak schematically here, we can say there are kind of campaign books and there are legacy books. Campaign books are pretty self-explanatory. They're just books that you know are written to influence a run for office or books that become an issue during a big campaign. And then of course there are legacy books when after the White House, a president tries to shape his legacy um, you know, through some kind of book, memoir, that sort of thing. And what I realized is that the first legacy book was actually written by John Adams and who you can see pictured here. And Kevin, if you'll hit the next button, the, uh, the first campaign book was actually written by Thomas Jefferson. This is a great portrait of Adams, but if you zoom in there, as I've done on the actual book, you can see that it says Jefferson's History of Virginia. So that's Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. 
that was really the first campaign book. It was a huge issue in the campaign of 1800 and a little bit in 1796. And then Adams wrote the first autobiography. So I quickly realized that this story was, was as long and as old as, as any story you could want to tell about America and its history. And that got me excited to keep digging in. As you'll see on the next slide, it's also a really complicated story. And that's one thing that, that jumped out to me pretty quickly. This is a letter from Abraham Lincoln. And he wrote it um, the year before he ran for president in 1860. And this letter was attached to, to what's called a biographical sketch. So Lincoln was, was pretty unknown as a national candidate. He wrote up a, a couple page document that described where he was from, how he got into politics, that kind of thing. And if you read it, you just can't help but like Lincoln. It's funny, it's self-deprecating, it's charming. It, it feels like a real asset for somebody who wants to run for president. It's not just that he had a great life story, it's that he could tell that life story really well. But in this letter, Lincoln actually, that Lincoln attached to the sketch, he said, of course it must not appear to have been written by myself. And I think it's worth pausing for a second on what he says because that's so counterintuitive. Lincoln had written something really smart that would help him run for president. He had written it himself. But when he shared that with journalists, he included a cover note that said, make sure no one knows that I wrote this. And the reason was that for a lot of big and complicated reasons involving how people ran for president or what people thought about authors as a professional role, in Lincoln's time and, and even a little bit after it, you couldn't really be seen as someone who would write a book and, and take credit for it because that would be seen as something really vain and the worst thing you could do if you were running for political office is make it look like you wanted to win political office. That's obviously quite a contrast from our current moment. And if anything, Lincoln's quote is, is, is of an even purer version of this irony because today politicians will often write books, except they don't write them, but they tell the journalists, make sure this looks like I have written it. So it's, we go from Lincoln who writes something great and says, please don't give me any credit to modern politicians who won't write anything at all, but say, yeah, I'll take the credit as well. That kind of complete twist is, is one of those ironies you often find in history. And, and it let me know that this story was, yes, going to be about important books and, and figures like Lincoln and Jefferson and Adams, but it was also going to be about bigger forces in American life, like celebrity, campaigning, um, authorship, history, reading, and, and, and how all these things intersected and reflected each other. If we can go to the next slide. Um, the other thing I will say about this topic is that, you know, it showed a really deep history and it showed a kind of surprising and, and complicated history, but I also think it showed a very human history. And, and I just think there's something about writing or working on a book, even if you're working with the help of somebody else, that will show a personal side of somebody. And I ended up finding lots of great behind the scenes stories to kind of capture the side of presidents that you might, uh, that you might think you know, but, but there's still more to learn. This is Adams after he gave up writing that autobiography I mentioned. He never published it because if he had published it during his lifetime, he would have gotten in trouble for that. But he did, uh, you know, he wrote it and intended for his, um, his family to publish it after he was gone. And he wrote it for about more than 400 pages and then gave up. And here's what he told a friend about giving up. You advise me to write my own life. I've made several attempts, but it is so dull an employment that I cannot endure it. I look so much like a small boy in my own eyes that with all my vanity, I cannot endure the sight of the picture. Honestly, that's more honest than, than anything Adams actually put in his book. But that's one of the things about looking at presidents as writers. It's a narrow question, but when you spend time with people who are spending time with books, whether it's creating them, reading them, um, you know, enjoying them, you can just get that kind of human and personal side of them. And I was really pleased as I did my research to find letters that nobody had seen before or, or personal angles on even some of the best known presidents in it so that this book became, you know, a very literary book, but also a very intimate biography that kind of helped shed light on these, uh, on these various presidents. All right, we can go to the next slide. Okay, I, uh, I've kind of given the overview, I think. Um, there's a lot of presidents in the book. We've got Adams and Jefferson all the way up to Obama with big chapters on Kennedy and Woodrow Wilson and, and Teddy Roosevelt and Lincoln and a lot of others. But uh, Scott, I'll throw it back to you and, and see what questions you have. Absolutely. So actually, I want to I want to put in a question now from a, an anonymous attendee because it touches on something you just mentioned. Now, this attendee asked, did president did presidents have ghostwriters or did early presidents write their own books? When did presidents begin using writers to tell their story? And I think that bounces off of what you're just saying. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really important question. Um, 
you know, ghostwriting is also, the history of ghostwriting is as old as American history itself. Uh, Washington's farewell address is one of the four or five most important documents, I think, in American history. It's, it's, it's a real secular scripture for politicians and voters and, and history lovers like us. But Washington did not write that in any real way. He, he, had, an, he had the ideas for it. He had an outline for it. He even sort of explained, this is the kind of style that I want. But the people who did most of the actual writing in terms of putting sentences on paper were Madison and Alexander Hamilton. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and I think that that's been going on for a long time. And I think the smart thing to do is to get yourself a ghostwriter as talented as James Madison or, or Alexander Hamilton. But this was widely known even at the time. You know, Adams and Jefferson in letters would say, well, of course, Washington borrows other people's pens. But what really makes it work is that he's involved in the process and that his name is attached to the final product, which, of course, made people pay attention to it. And, and it was authorized, if not authored by Washington. So there's a really long example or long history of presidents using ghostwriters. Now, there are a lot who did their own writing. Sometimes it's surprising. Somebody like Calvin Coolidge, um, who we don't think of as, as a really literary president, was actually an incredibly talented writer. And although he worked with ghostwriters some while he was in the White House, when it came to his writing before and after, that was all him. But there have been lots of presidents who work with ghostwriters. I think the key is that you need to have not ghostwriting or no ghostwriting, you just need to have good ghostwriting. And so you can even see in specific presidents, somebody like Ronald Reagan, uh, his first book, which is not well known, he worked with a ghostwriter, he worked really carefully with the ghostwriter, and it's a book that reveals a lot about Reagan and his worldview. His second book, the one that he got paid $7 million for after the White House, Reagan didn't care at all. I interviewed the ghostwriter and, and you know, it seemed like they just had very little interaction at all. And that was not a good book. But it wasn't a bad book because it was ghostwritten. It was a bad book because Reagan didn't work hard on it with the help of a ghostwriter. So all this to say, yeah, that's an important issue. I get into that a lot. I certainly get into it a lot with Kennedy. Um, yes. But it, it's not the most important issue. And, and for me, ghostwritten books can still be revealing and important. Yeah, if the, if the president is involved or the person who's going to be president is involved in writing them, it tells you something about them. Um, you know, one of the things that, that interests me about your book, because I'm, I've been fascinated with the presidents since childhood. My family can tell you all about that fascination. But I'm also a historian of the book who studies the history of authorship and publishing and reading. And readers who come to your book, author in chief, might be surprised to find not just the president authors in your book, but also sections on the publishing industry and really revealing sections about ordinary readers across the sweep of American history. I'm curious, why did you decide to include those kinds of stories here? What, what do the stories of ordinary readers contribute to understanding the presidents as authors? Sure. Um, I, I'd, I'd be happy to get into that. Kevin, do you want to skip through a couple slides here? Because these are more kind of like behind the scenes research things. So if we can go forward, maybe one more, a couple more. Um, all right, there, that's good. Oh, let's go back. Okay, um, so I, I appreciate your question about sort of, you know, why have book history, why have all this publishing history, and, and why have stories about regular readers? So as, as I was working on this book, it, I kind of came up with these ideas while working on the first chapter, which was on Thomas Jefferson. And, and it was a tricky chapter because, you know, Notes on the State of Virginia is a widely known book and it has some of Jefferson's best writing. It also has, a, particularly on the issues of slavery and race, some of Jefferson's worst writing. But it was a book that, that was widely known. Um, but to tell the story of that book, uh, you really have to be able to tell the story of the publishing trade more broadly, because that book had sold more than 20,000 copies with a couple decades after it came out. Today, I mean, 20,000 copies, most authors would be delighted by that. But still, it, it's not, you know, there are a lot of books that sell 20,000 copies in any given year. But if you adjust it in terms of population, that's actually closer to half a million copies. It, it's much more impressive in terms of it being an influential book. And if you understand what the book trade was like in Jefferson's time, then it becomes, you know, more impressive still. And I just, when I, when I said that I'm somebody who likes to know about the history of things and how things works, I like to know that in a really concrete and tangible way. And so when I started working on Jefferson's book, I had questions like, well, how much did a book cost in Jefferson's time? What did it feel like to walk into a bookstore in Jefferson's time? And thankfully, because of really wonderful research done by book historians and literary historians, it's easy to answer those kinds of questions. We know that a book in Jefferson's time, you know, if you were a working class person like a carpenter, it could take you two or three days to earn enough money to buy one book. And so 
with that money, you could buy a book or you could buy a couple pounds of sugar and a new pair of shoes and, and you know, cloth to make clothes and all kinds of other things. So books were really expensive objects at that time. And they were also just hard to move around. You know, we think of books today where you can get them in one click, even from your local bookstore or from Amazon or anywhere else. But in Jefferson's time, you know, in any time before trains, especially, it was hard to get books from point A to point B. And so I realized, you know, just to understand Jefferson's book and the impact it had, you had to understand a little bit about the publishing history. And also, frankly, I just, I really like literary history. I, I, I'm a books person as much as I'm a president's person. And it was a nice chance to kind of get into that sort of personal side. Um, this bookstore is actually, it's a picture from the 1920s of a bookstore in Northampton, Massachusetts. So not that far away from y'all. And it was the bookstore that Calvin Coolidge liked to go into. And this is about the time when Calvin Coolidge would have gone into it. So it, it's a moment to, I think, see another side of presidents. I love that this picture of a bookstore feels old, but it also feels sort of timeless. It's not that different than any of the great independent bookstores you can still go to in Massachusetts today. And uh, if you can do the next slide, Kevin, I also just love that, you know, <laughs> cats in bookstores. This is a picture of the cat named Folio in, in the 1920s. Um, and, and I actually looked at some back issues from the newspaper or from the, the bookstore's newsletter to, to understand or to, to learn a little bit about Folio. Cause I just, you know, once I saw this picture who wouldn't want to know more about this, this adorable cat. So I just liked having that kind of literary side because I helped, thought it helped us understand presidents better. But um, it also was important to, I think, understand regular readers. Um, and that, that also kind of occurred to me in the Jefferson chapter. If we can look at the next slide, this is a picture of Jefferson's bookshelves. And he obviously had many of these custom bookshelves built. I think it's important to note that these bookshelves were built by Sally Hemming, his brother, um, one of Jefferson's slaves. And so once again, when you see somebody at their most bookish, you can often see them at their most personal and, and sort of see a different side of them than, than they always wanna convey. But when I think, when I, when I said how expensive books were in this time period and how difficult it was to transport books around, when you see shelves like this, you, you just can't really understand what life was like for an 18th century reader. You can understand what life was like for Thomas Jefferson, but he was such an outlier in terms of literary um, and passionate people who like to read that I felt like I needed another story to kind of counterbalance it. So in the next slide, you'll see the closest thing we have to a picture of somebody named Devereux Jarrett. It's kind of a strange thing. It's, it's, um, it's on the door of his church in Virginia. He was a pastor among other professions. And it's just sort of like a profile of his face. You can see the nose kind of pointing out there. And Jarrett grew up in the same county where Monticello is. And he was somebody who was really educated, very intelligent. He was a school teacher in addition to being a pastor. He loved books, but what he didn't have were books. There's a wonderful story in the autobiography he wrote that I, that I put in my book of where Jarrett wanted to get a new book about math. And he got on a horse and rode seven miles one way, including crossing a river, just to borrow this one book, brought it back home, and stayed up at night reading it by firelight until he fell asleep. That's a lot of work for a book about math, but that's the kind of work you had to do if you were a passionate reader in this time period. And so I just felt like Jarrett's story sort of reminded us what was different about Jefferson's story, but also captions, captured something important about the kind of shared American story that they both played a part in. In the next slide, you can see another reader that I highlight, and I think I highlight six or seven, um, six or seven readers in, the, in this book. And this is somebody named James Carruthers who grew up uh, near the end of the 19th century in Michigan. And um, on the, if you press one more button, Kevin, we can see a quote from his autobiography where he talked about his reading. He said, Carruthers said that he wrote books to learn about, quote, the careers of American public men. I labored at self-improvement. I still recall the delight I found. And so one thing I noticed as I was putting together these portraits of, of regular readers, and Scott, your research and, and your first book was really helpful in kind of understanding this, this trend too, is that America for a really long time has just had a lot of readers who might not have had as many books as Thomas Jefferson, but still got the same things out of books that somebody like Jefferson talked about. Americans have always sort of had this didactic streak where we like to read practically and we like to read seriously and we like to read politically. We like to know about the people who are in charge or the people who want to be in charge. And that's why so many presidential books have been bestsellers, even if they're often forgotten today. And that's why they've made such a big difference and been so essential to deciding some of the biggest campaigns in our, our country's history. So in, in my book, I call us a nation of nonfiction. And, and I really think that's true. 
And so by telling the presidential stories and the stories of their books, but also telling the stories of regular readers who would read about them and vote for them. And I think that just kind of captures a kind of sort of trajectory and, and trend and, and really important part of America's literary culture that I don't know had necessarily been captured that, that well before. There, there's not really that many great books for regular readers, for lay readers about the history of publishing. And so I really wanted my book to sort of have that threaded throughout. And I also wanted it to focus on nonfiction because that's a kind of writing that doesn't always get enough scholarly attention, but it's a kind of writing that's been so important to readers for such a long time. Basically, if you're a history fan, if you're somebody who likes history, and I assume if you're, you're coming to this event that you are, my book will tell you the history of yourself. It'll tell you what people like you who lived in the 18th century or the 19th century, and I promise you there were people like you who loved to read about American history and American presidents. It will show you what your life would have been like if you were a passionate reader living in those time periods. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more having, having done the work on my first book and, and read the diaries and letters of so many readers who were just eating up biographies, both because they were fascinated by the person whom they were reading about and because they were taking lessons for their own life. And I think that's just a, a great theme as we think about it. And if we just think about people reading fiction, we're missing a lot of the picture. Um, I want to turn to a couple of the, the presidents you write about. Uh, some of the stories in Author-in-Chief may be familiar to presidential historians and buffs, like the story of Ulysses Grant r racing against cancer to complete his book before he died. But some of the other stories you recovered are just remarkable revelations. For example, you discovered the story of Abraham Lincoln creating a campaign book at a time when presidential candidates were supposedly not campaigning overtly, not just the biographical sketch you talked about, but a whole book. Right, right. If we go to the next slide, we can actually see the title page of this book. Well, actually, sorry. <laughs> I had to include that from the uh, from the great Ford film because this is how we think of Lincoln, right? We think of him as a book lover and somebody who was formed by books. And that's true, but we don't necessarily think of him as an author. The next image will, will show us otherwise. Um, Lincoln was the first presidential candidate to publish a book in his own words. Um, Jefferson had notes on the state of Virginia, obviously. Adams had written other books. There were other examples. But those books weren't necessarily written when they were thinking about running for president. Lincoln's book was something that he very deliberately and, and very conscientiously and, and honestly kind of obsessively pulled together as he was preparing to run in 1860. And it, it's such an interesting story because it's not a well-known story. There have been so many great biographies written on Lincoln, but none of them really talk about his book and, and the work he did behind the scenes and the impact that it made. Um, but it also is, is something that tells us a little bit, I think, about him as a person and, and sort of how he saw the world and, and how he saw America's political culture. So this book came out in 1860, and what it is, is it's, it's the textual form of the debates between Lincoln and Douglas. And the reason Lincoln was able to put this together and, and to do it accurately, at least, you know, he could have written anything and called it was, said it was the political debates, but it was very important to him. And it was very important to the success of this book, that it be objective, that it be a fair um, accounting of their debates. So in 1858, when they were running for Senate, when they were doing their famous debates, um, newspapers sent stenographers around with them. And, you know, if we think our media is polarized and, and partisan today, it's got nothing on the 19th century media. It was so bad that, you know, Lincoln newspapers had their stenographers and Douglas newspapers had their stenographers. And often the results would not line up because they had such different agendas. And, and you know, it's, it's really easy if, if there's a gust of wind and you're the person who's not your candidate is talking, it'd be like, eh, do I need that paragraph? We'll just let it slide and he'll sound kind of crazy. So there were lots of newspapers on different sides making these recordings. And it's interesting that Douglas didn't see this as important. He would often repeat himself to the point that the, even the stenographers who were favored were you know, favored towards him and, and wanted him to win would stop taking notes because they knew they could just transcribe the same thing, version of the same speech he had given at a previous stop. But Lincoln understood that these stenographers and their accounts were gonna be published in newspapers all across the state of Illinois and before long all across the country because people were really interested in, in this race and in what these two orators were saying about slavery, which of course was the defining issue for the country at that time. And so Lincoln would sort of build on his arguments. He would say one thing at one stop and then return to it at the next stop but amplify it or, or bring in something Douglas had said that contradicted it. Or, and he really, Lincoln treated it as an ongoing conversation. And I think that's because he was already thinking in terms of print. He was thinking not just of the 10,000 or 12,000 people who were gathered around them. He was thinking about the hundreds of thousands of people who, who would eventually read this. So that was all in 1858. But 
even though Lincoln understood that, once that election was over, those speeches and those debate transcripts kind of disappeared because there wasn't Google back then. There wasn't an easy way to find old issues. There wasn't an American Antiquarian Society in every state where everyone could just go and find every issue that they needed. It was, you know, once the newspapers were gone, in a real sense, the debates were gone too for regular people. So what Lincoln did, and we can see this in the next slide, is that after he lost to Douglas, he got right to work. You would think that Lincoln might have been depressed, might have been sad, might have said, you know, I, what am I going to do next? Instead, he threw himself into this project. And there are actually at least nine surviving letters from the two months after the election, probably more that didn't survive, because Lincoln was trying to get newspapers, copies of the debates, and not just, you know, one copy, but multiple copies, and also copies from both sides. So he could use the pro-Douglas outlets for Douglas's account and words, and the pro-Lincoln ones for his, in an attempt to be fair and to appeal to all sorts of people. And so Lincoln was, was truly obsessed with this idea. He sent this letter to um, somebody in Chicago who was an important editor. And when he didn't hear back from the guy within a week, he sent another letter and followed up with somebody else. A week's not much time to, you know, in, in the 19th century. But Lincoln knew that every day he waited, it would become harder to find the newspapers that he needed. In the next image, you can see what all this work ended up producing. After just a couple months, Lincoln had the newspapers and he would carefully cut them out. And, and the next slide actually has a close up of the scrapbook that he worked on. You can see that he would very carefully cut out the newspapers. He would add quotation marks or make tiny little emendations where the stenographer had misheard. He took out the stage directions because he was really thinking about this as in terms of it being like a printed literary book. And you can see that Lincoln put together these, these, um, these transcripts from both him and Douglas, along with a couple other speeches from both of them. This book became a huge bestseller. It, it, it's a pretty complicated story so far, but it's even more complicated about how Lincoln found the right printer and everything like that. Once he did though, it, it became a massive bestseller. Again, if you adjust it in terms of population, it sold the equivalent of a half a million copies today. And one of the key things I used while doing my research that I felt really lucky about was being able to use computerized databases where so often political historians will look at what the New York Times says and the Washington Post says, and that's it. And I, I mean, that's because it's, you know, it, it's just incredibly arduous to go beyond that um, if you're talking about political issues. But I was able to use keywords. I could use things like Follett, the name of the publisher, plus Lincoln, or Lincoln plus Douglas plus book, and use those key terms to find newspaper coverage. And what I found was that this book was everywhere and that this book came out earlier than people had realized, that it was circulating in a really concrete way. And that it's not just that people were reading it, people on both sides of the slavery issue were reading it because both sides of that debate were represented. People were sharing it with other people. People would take the copy of the book and tell their friend, hey, have you read this? And the friend would say, have I read it? I've already got my own copy and someone else has offered me one too. So there's no question that this book was an absolutely vital part of the uh, of the race in 1860, partly because Lincoln wasn't campaigning. As, as Scott said, there were a lot of cultural forces that made it difficult for somebody to go out and speak on the stump speech um, the way that, you know, we just kind of take for granted a politician will do today. So Lincoln was pretty quiet in 1860, but he also could afford to be because he had been smart enough to put his most eloquent statements together in book form. And he knew that anybody who had a question about it could go right there. And in fact, sometimes people would ask Lincoln, what do you think about this issue? And he would say, well, there's a book you should check out. Um, if we can go to the next image, this is Lincoln's um, parlor in his home in Springfield, Illinois, which you can still visit, maybe some of you had. And I found a story in one of those newspapers where they talked about, someone talked about going to visit Lincoln and he received a hundred copies of the book from the publisher as his payment. Um, you know, Lincoln was very involved behind the scenes, but he never really said, I worked on this book in public. He didn't really receive credit for it. If, if anything, that probably would have just hurt his campaign because again, you didn't want to be seen as vain. But he got those hundred copies and, and he circulated those copies. And the person who visited him in 1860 said there were that the, the parlor was lined with copies of the book. And I just love imagining that because we all know how much Lincoln loved book. And so to imagine this room, lined with copies of his own book. It, it must have been incredibly important to him. He actually told the publisher in a letter that when, when the publisher agreed to finally publish the scrapbook, to, to publish Lincoln's book, Lincoln said, I esteem the compliment paid me in this matter as the very highest I've ever received. He wasn't president yet, so we can't say that publishing a book meant more to him than being president. But I think we can say, and, and I think we all understand how much books meant to him um, in general and how much it would have meant to see his own book put together. On the next, 
Okay. Yeah. One last slide, though, I think that that's useful is just talking about publishing history. And this is the printing presses that, that the book was published on. These are steam powered presses. And that was a big change from Jefferson's time to Lincoln's time. It made books cheaper. It made it, uh, you know, they could, you could then put the books on trains and get them out more quickly. And so those kinds of changes, I think, were, were why it's important to understand literary history, because you can understand that Lincoln was the first to, to see the, the possibilities here and the first to see that, that cheap books and widely available books could make a difference. And the thing that I always think about and I always remember is that when Lincoln did this um, lecture on discoveries and inventions, which is not one of the best known Lincoln speeches, but I kind of think it should be. I included a long chunk of it in that, that best presidential anthology because it's so interesting. But Lincoln talks about you know inventions and discoveries and, and things that human beings use to sort of progress and develop over time. And the thing he cared about the most was the printing press. He, he talked about it and he said, to emancipate the mind is the great task which printing came to the world to perform. He wouldn't use that word emancipate lightly in 1858, 1859 when he was delivering this lecture, but he used it metaphorically because it was powerful and because he really believed that books could change the world. Books had changed his life. And I believe that, that his book changed American history because it played such an important role in him becoming president. That's fantastic. And, and we have some questions that I think connect questions from viewers that connect to some of what you've been talking about. You mentioned that Lincoln's book by today's population would have sold half a million copies. Mary Beth Norton asks about female readers of general nonfiction and particularly of presidential books. I'm looking at the picture you have here. Um, that's a woman tending that press, um, right. you know, and, and women were certainly involved as, as workers in the, in the publishing and print industry. As you were looking at, at readers, ordinary readers, did you learn about women readers of presidential books? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the regular readers I highlight is, um, was a woman who lived in Ohio and her family had moved to Ohio during the Great Migration. And um, you know, she was somebody who went to a Carnegie Library. I often tried to choose these readers because they could connect to some of the kind of bigger themes and, and, and aspects of literary history. But yeah, it's these kinds of books appealed to everyone, and this sort of didactic style of reading appealed to everyone. Honestly, when, when novels first became big, um, there was a big push to, to not allow female readers access to them. And you know, th this push was as ugly and as stereotyped um, as, as we might imagine, where people said, you know, books will excite the female mind and create, you know, inflame their passions and these kinds of things. Obviously, you know, completely bigoted and backwards views, but those were the views in the 18th century and the 19th century. That fiction was was too passionate and, and too distracting for everybody, but especially for female readers. So there was actually a huge, um, a, a huge portion of readers who who read didactic books and sought out these kinds of books who were female writers and for female readers. And and I tried wherever I could. I mean. You're kind of limited when you're writing about a book about presidents that thus far at least it's it's a book that's going to have mostly male subjects but i tried to include female readers and, and female authors whenever i could you know one of the first american authors to register a copyright was mercy otis warren uh, a female poet and a really important historian in her own right and so i tried to tell their stories whenever i could and, and the woman working that steam press is a great example because you know the transition from regular printing presses like Benjamin Franklin used, where you got to pull the lever to steam printing presses, that wasn't an easy one. So there were a lot of people who said, we don't want the new way, we want the old way. And that opened up jobs doing it the new way. And then women were ones who stepped in and filled those jobs. And a lot of the people who ran these kinds of steam presses were women. That's just one of many examples where women played such an essential part in you know, the development and, and the flourishing of America's literary culture. We have another question here, um, and this maybe harks back to your showing the Lincoln scrapbook. Um, the, the questioner asks, are all of the president's manuscripts with their presidential libraries or in scattered archives? Have most or any of them been digitized? I was curious where you found that scrapbook because that is that is quite a find to see Lincoln piecing together the story himself. Sure, the scrapbook, that, that one we're very lucky in that there is a there was a huge army of Lincoln bibliophiles, you know, pretty much as soon as he died. And so the not just that scrapbook, but even the specific copies of his debates that he had inscribed at various people have all been exhaustively cataloged. And, and that particular scrapbook ended up at the Library of Congress. So that one, you know, that one wasn't too hard to find. It, it's just interesting that, that nobody had really pieced together the whole story and realized how important the book had been to Lincoln and how important the book was, was to other readers. But that book was pretty easy to find. 
in terms of the broader question, though, it, it's a really great one. And, and I found stuff all over the place. Somebody like Kennedy, I spent a lot of time in his presidential library. But even then, you know, where all the papers had been exhaustively cataloged and, and organized, um, I still found a lot of new stuff. And I know that because at, at the Kennedy Library, you're actually not supposed to see Kennedy's handwriting because, you know, there's a vetting process before you can go in there and do research. But even with the kind of approved scholars in there, they would still steal things with Kennedy's handwriting on it. This is what the librarians told me and sell them. And so eventually they just did only photocopies of Kennedy's handwriting. But because I went into the Kennedy Library and I said, you know, I'm very focused on Kennedy and books and understanding Kennedy and literature. And so I was looking at things like every draft he wrote of the speech before he spoke in front of the National Book Awards. I honestly don't know that anyone had ever looked at that since it was originally filed after his death because I found examples of his handwriting. And by the time I was at the end of my few days at the Kennedy Library, I think the librarians were ready to throw me out because I kept having to raise my hand and saying, I'm really sorry, but I, I found another example of Kennedy's handwriting that you guys have missed because nobody had really looked at that before, even in an archive. So having that narrow question really helped me at the presidential libraries, but it also helped me go to other strange places. Like I found an example of Andrew Jackson's letters that, that nobody had seen before. Um, I, I had to call up the people at the Andrew Jackson papers. And that's, you mentioned digitizing. A lot of presidential papers have been really carefully edited and digitized so anybody can search them. And they're also available in wonderful hardbound volumes that would be at any good research library. Um, and so the Jackson letters or the Jackson papers are, are almost finished with that. But I found a few letters of his that had gone to his, um, that were between him and a printer. And I found them in the printer's archives, not in anything relating to Jackson. So then I had to call up the Jackson people and say, you're not going to like this, but I know you finished the volume with the letter, with the stuff in 1818, you know, 20 years ago. And it's, it's not even in print anymore. But I think this is, I think this belongs with that stuff. And of course, they were happy to have it, but frustrated that they hadn't found it. But when you when you have these narrow questions and when you look in strange places, like with Reagan, I found Reagan letters nobody had seen because I, I went to his first ghostwriter, uh, a guy who who has his papers at, in a, at Boston College. And he had, you know, written some books about Walt Disney and things like that. And so his papers had been saved for that reason. But I went through his correspondence, found letters between him and Reagan, and all of a sudden sort of had a new interpretation of Reagan in the early 1960s and, and how much control Reagan had over his political rise and his kind of political self-fashioning. So the papers are all over the place. Um, it's a lot easier to work with presidents than it is to work with regular readers where you've got to read their handwriting and stuff, as you know, Scott. But uh, even with the presidents, when, when I asked the right questions and, and took the time and had the help of archivists and librarians, I found a lot of fresh stuff sort of all over the place. You sure did. And one of the surprises in this book is that Calvin Coolidge becomes an unlikely protagonist. He's a pioneer, it turns out, in both the campaign book and the legacy book. Uh, I, I will mention 14 U.S. presidents have been elected members of the American Antiquarian Society. But Coolidge also has the unusual distinction of being the only U.S. president who was also at one time president of the American Antiquarian Society, equivalent of uh, the chair of our council, our governing board today. How did Calvin Coolidge, of all people, come to take such a prominent place in your book? Sure. I think the next slide should have a picture of Coolidge presiding over one of the uh, uh, society meetings. There we go. There he, there he is in our own Antiquarian Hall, and, and uh, viewers tonight who've been in Antiquarian Hall will recognize this. Uh, you might also recognize the card catalogs, which are no longer on, in the main floor of, of Antiquarian Hall, but, um, but that, is our, that is our main reading room. And there's Coolidge presiding over it all. Um, so, I, you know, I, I realized looking at some Coolidge biographies, I, I knew that he had written a campaign book that was pretty important. Um, he became vice president. And when he was nominated, it was kind of a big surprise. People didn't think he would be nominated. But the person who nominated him did it because he had read Coolidge's book. And, and I ended up finding a lot more information about that by looking at old newspaper clippings and, and finding profiles of the person who nominated him and that kind of thing. But I kind of knew that Coolidge was, was going to be an important part of the book. What I didn't realize was that he was such a careful and, and conscientious writer. And I guess I should have, because if you go back and read his speeches, however you view his politics, it's clear that he's a very talented speaker, a very talented writer. And he has kind of the magic ingredient that, that not that many presidents have had, where he had a specific political philosophy, he had a specific oratorical style, and he had kind of a, a public persona. And those three things all overlapped. You know, he was kind of the, the quiet, um, diligent New Englander. 
His prose is very simple, very kind of aphoristic. It feels a lot like Benjamin Franklin's writing. Um, and then he also had, uh, you know, that, that matched up with his politics, that matched up with his style and with his celebrity. So it all came together in a way that, you know, Obama would be a really good comparison, actually, where he had a speaking style and a life story and a political worldview that all kind of fused together. And, and that was essential to, to Coolidge uh, having such a successful career as an American politician. On the next slide, you'll see uh, just an important bit of context, just something that makes that, that kind of tickles me. Um, this was this was really where I kind of figured things out. It, this was a story that ran in the New York Times that called Coolidge the most literary man who has occupied the White House since 1865. And I didn't actually find that newspaper clip. I found in the at Coolidge's presidential library, I found the letter that he wrote to the journalist who wrote that story where, I mean, Coolidge is, you know, still pretty humble, but you can tell reading the letter and reading his other letters that he's extremely pleased that somebody noticed and he's extremely flattered that someone compared him to Lincoln. And he, you know, is just happy to receive attention for things that he worked on so carefully. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that there is, um, you know, this is a time when sort of books are becoming even cheaper and you're seeing even more writing. This is, uh, this is from an election before when Teddy Roosevelt was actually running. And on the next slide, I sort of zoom in on the front page of this newspaper. And I just love this. It's uh, Roosevelt on our presidents. He thinks poorly of former executives, but very well of himself. So this is basically a hit, a hit piece, a, you know, a kind of political ad against Roosevelt built entirely out of excerpts from Teddy Roosevelt's books. That's the kind of thing you could do because finally politicians were comfortable doing their own writing, having their own books come out, going out and giving speeches. Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson were both essential you know, figures and in this transformation and honestly in the transformation of the presidency itself and in kind of creating the new modern version of the presidency. But Coolidge was important in it too. And on the next slide, you can kind of see his two books. There's Have Faith in Massachusetts, which was such an important part of him becoming president. But the thing that struck me the most was actually his legacy book, his autobiography. And it reached the most readers, not as a book, but running in the pages of Cosmopolitan, which yes, it's that Cosmopolitan. It was a, it was a very different magazine. In, and it was one of the most popular magazines in the country at that time. And so the editor put the full court press on Coolidge because he really wanted Coolidge to write about being president after Coolidge left the White House. And this first issue, which had Coolidge's story and appeared you know, not long after Coolidge had left the White House, it, it was a sensation. You couldn't go to newsstands and find it because it sold out within 12 hours. And the, the magazine received, I think it was more than 1,200 requests from different newsstands saying, we've got to have more of the Coolidge issue. We can't sell it. We, you know, we can't keep it in stock. People are so interested. And they were interested because it was fascinating to have the inside glimpse of, of a president's life, but they were also fascinated because Coolidge was such a great writer. He wrote a pretty slim biography. You know, Grant's memoirs are, are the deserved classic of, of the presidential memoir genre, but Coolidge's book is about a sixth, a sixth as long as Grant's, so it's much slimmer. And it's also just really personal. Coolidge didn't spend much time getting caught up in sort of political debates or what his beliefs were or what issues he took stands on because he believed that readers already knew that they'd been following politics. Instead, he just really focused on capturing what did it feel like to be president? What did it feel like when Herbert Hoover died and, and you became, or um, I'm sorry, Warren, Hooding, or, ugh, Warren Harding died and you, and you became president and your father was the one who walked up the stairs at that Vermont house and, and told you that you were now the most powerful person in the world. And even more, what did it feel like when your son died? Because Coolidge lost his teenage son in the White House. And it was a really powerful story. It was, it was something that, you know, the funeral was carried on radios around the country. So it wasn't news to anyone. But to have Coolidge, a, a writer of such precision and talent and, um, and clarity, give his side of that story and to sort of say, you know, this is what it felt like to be the most powerful person in the world, but have no power to save my son who was dying in front of me readers responded to that. And, you know, it's, it's that nation of nonfiction thing. It's people wanting to know more about their leaders and about American history. And there aren't many presidents who did a better job of giving readers what they wanted than, than Calvin Coolidge. And that links to a question we have from Bartholomew Sparrow, uh, who writes, I've found that presidential mem memoirs often spin facts and strategically excise some facts and events so as to present a distorted view of their careers and or presidencies. Um, and, and 
Mr. Sparrow asks, which presidential memoirs have you found to be the most reliable and which the least? I, I would note that throughout your book, you, you have a running theme that the campaign books, or at least the books they write before they become president, are often better books than the legacy books. That's true. That's true. And there, there's a lot of reasons for that. And, and the questioner gets at some of them, that, that a president just has this sort of inherent desire to spin. I, I think the best example of this is actually Lyndon Johnson, who, like Coolidge, we might not necessarily think of as, as, as a really literary president. But Johnson was smart. He went out and got good ghostwriters for his presidential memoirs. Actually, one of his ghostwriters was Doris Kearns Goodwin, who would go on to become one of the most acclaimed presidential historians this country has ever had. Uh, Simon Schuster will be very proud of me for saying that, right? <laughs> uh, but she really is. She's a she's a wonderful historian, and she worked with with um, Johnson on his uh, presidential memoirs. But that's not to say that Johnson's presidential memoirs, which are called the vantage point, are any good, because frankly, they're not. Um, what would happen is Johnson's ghostwriters would do careful research and develop really good questions and sit down with Johnson and ask him those smart questions. And he would give terrific responses. He would do impressions of you know, political opponents that he didn't really like. He would swear a lot. He would tell great stories. And he would capture exactly you know, what he felt at the time and why he did what he did. So his ghostwriters, including Goodwin and others, would go off and turn this, this rich material into chapters. And it, they thought it was great. They were thrilled. But then when they brought it back to Johnson, Johnson would say, we can't publish any of this. You're making me sound like a backwoods Texas politician. I don't want this. I want to sound presidential. By the time they got his book sounding presidential, and, and that's an adjective I found again and again in my research, the books were exactly what the questioner describes. You know, they were full of spin. They were completely lacking in any life or personality. And all that had been drained out because Johnson had this idea in his head of what he thought a presidential book should sound like, even though the much better book, you know, that everyone had the material to put that together between him and the ghostwriters, he just wouldn't allow it to happen. And so when I was working on that best presidential writing um, anthology, I, when I included some stuff from Johnson, I, of course, included some of his big speeches, like the Great Society, but I also included the raw transcripts from him talking to the ghostwriters, because when he talks about, you know, what do you remember the day Kennedy was shot, the final version in the book is not really that revealing, but the version of just the raw unedited transcript of him talking to those ghostwriters, it's one of the most uh, revealing things you can ever read about Johnson, and so I just wish that more presidents would allow their personal views and their personal perspectives and experiences to be captured instead of worrying too much about what is statesmanlike, what is presidential, because when you start worrying about that, you're putting yourself on a path to a really bad book that might sell a lot of copies, but isn't going to change many minds or move many hearts. Yeah, one of the ways in which you um, make the presidents a bit more human. It's a running theme throughout authors in chief, um, throughout author in chief, which people will find in the footnotes is presidents writing poetry, uh, mostly I would say pretty bad poetry. Sure. That's definitely true. Uh, Kevin, if we can kip, skip a couple slides here to, to get to the, um, this is just Truman's presidential memoirs. You can see him signing it, but we can keep going here. One more. And so, yeah, it, the presidential poetry I thought was, was actually really important and, and an example of why it mattered to kind of keep the literary history of America in mind at the same time you're keeping the political history of America in mind. And, and a quick example of this right here is this very famous line from the Edinburgh Review. I, I guess it might not be really famous. It's famous to you and me and, and other book historians. It might not be famous to more broadly, but the Edinburgh Review, a really important quarterly magazine in, in or sorry, monthly in, uh, in Europe, you know, one of their one of their best critics wrote in the uh, in the early 19th century, in the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book? And so that's a good joke. That's a good cheap shot. I can't deny it. But it wasn't just a cheap shot about books. It, it was a cheap shot about nations. And it was a cheap shot about political power because poetry and creative writing was, you know, the pop popular culture of the time and, and was really widely respected and widely consumed. And so the fact that at this point, there hadn't been any great American authors yet who could measure up to the great authors on the on the continent or in England uh, was a real strike against America's character and America's power and America's bil ability to be a, a, a real player on the international scene. There's actually a, a letter from John Quincy Adams that'll come up, Kevin, if you hit the button again, that in 1796, so this is when John Quincy Adams is still a diplomat, he writes to his father, John Adams, and says, the Americans have in Europe a sad reputation on the article of literature, and I shall purpose to render a service to my country by devoting to it the remainder of my life. So 
Adams, unfortunately, didn't do this. And, and it's one of his great regrets, honestly, but he became president instead of a poet. But at the time, he really wanted to be a poet because, you know, poets were the legislators of the world in at least the terms of intellectual reputations. And so America's lack in that really hurt them. Um, if you hit the button one more time, Kevin, you can see that when John Quincy Adams actually ran in 1824 against Andrew Jackson, one of the pamphlets at that time that was attacking Jackson used that famous book review line. What will the Edinburgh and quarterly reviewers who have hitherto defamed even the best writings of our countrymen say of people who want a man to govern them who cannot spell more than about one word in four? So that's, that's, a, that's an unfair caricature of Andrew Jackson, although I, we could probably all agree that few presidents more richly deserve unfair caricatures than Jackson himself for, for a lot of reasons. But still, you know, the attacks on Jackson and John Quincy Adams were in some sense reflections of this kind of bigger debate about poetry. And so I, I loved including bad presidential poetry in the footnotes, but I, I hope I never lost sight of the fact that even bad poetry was still a sincere attempt to sort of represent America and its ideas and, and help it compete on an international stage. So Kevin, if you wanna take us through some of these slides, let's, let's look at some bad presidential poetry. This is James Madison when he was an undergraduate at Princeton um, writing about some of his classmates. And I'm gonna let you let you all provide your own gloss on what exactly he's saying here. Uh, with lice collected from the beds where Spring and Craig lay down their heads, sometimes a goat steps on the pump, which animates old Warford's trunk. So an example of, of Madison's youthful poetry. Uh, I, th I think we should all be happy that he, he turned to more politically minded prose instead. The next example is actually from John Quincy Adams, who remember, became president, but his whole life could never quite shake the idea that he wanted to be a poet. And, and he wrote poetry along the time. And he wrote a, a few poems that sort of stood the test of time, at least the time of his own century. Emerson was a fan of a couple Adams po poems, but mostly what Adams wrote is, is sort of malicious political satire yeah. and attack. And, and you can see that in this, in this bit of poetry about Jefferson. Yeah. Let Dusky Sally henceforth bear the name of Isabella and let the mountain all of salt be christened Monticello. So this was just a way to attack Jefferson and to bring up the Sally Hemings issue, which, you know, sort of like ghostwriting, wasn't necessarily widely discussed, but the people who knew knew, and, and the people who knew would use it for, you know, political attacks, regardless of how it reflected on, on Hemings or, or the, you know, unjust and, and unfair power dynamic between her and Jefferson. It was still something that, that Adams could use as a political cheap shot and he used poetry to convey it. The next slide is Warren Harding. <laughs> uh, 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 These were the letters that were discovered relatively recently, right? The, the yeah. Warren Harding's letters, letters to one of his, one of his mistresses. That's exactly right. And, and, you know, in addition to the letters, he would also write her poetry because again, poetry was, was the popular culture of this time. Um, I love your poise of perfect thighs. I can't believe there's going to be a recording of me saying this out loud. I, <laughs> people could read this for themselves if they want. That, that might, that might be, uh, that might be that, horrible yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Uh, just imagine Warren Harding in, in his best baritone, um, conveying it, but, but you can see that this is this kind of, these kinds of examples show that this is what, you know, that presidents were bookish and presidents cared about books and, and presidents cared about writing. And that changed over time. The, the, the next slide is actually an example of Coolidge when he was an undergraduate in Massachusetts. Um, and he, what he wrote wasn't poetry because at this point, big magazines were, were what everyone was reading. Poetry has, was important, but less important. Short stories, novels were becoming more important and more widely accepted. I'd mentioned earlier that for a while, there was a real desire to see fiction as a problem, as, as a distraction not unlike the way uh, people in a previous generation to ours would talk about television, fiction was treated the same way. Well, at this point, fiction is ubiquitous and, and Coolidge actually tried to write a short story of his own and published it in the student paper. Waldo Martin said the emotionless Margaret, I need no explanation, I know now, how I have loved you, how I've trusted you, robber, murder, betrayer. The thing that always kills me about this quotation is why would you describe somebody as emotionless and then punctuate their quotation with exclamation point after exclamation <laughs> point, the uh, least emotionless punctuation uh, mark that we have. But, you know, Coolidge was a Coolidge was an undergraduate and God forbid anyone dig up the things I wrote when I was an undergraduate too. 
the point is that you can see this presidential poetry and it's fun and it sort of captures them as, as young literary um, aspirants, but it also sort of tells you something about the bigger literary culture, whether it's John Quincy Adams wanting to defend his country on an international scale or Calvin Coolidge sort of trying out this burgeoning new form of, of mass literature that, that was so popular at the time. I'm going to I'm going to pull together two questions we have from viewers uh, as we near our end. Um, we have one question about presidents who didn't write books. Did they communicate in other ways uh, or is their lack of authorship compensated by other communication attributes? And on the other end, since we're heading into playoffs time, Tom Bedell writes, I'm guessing Teddy Roosevelt. But who is the all time presidential writing champ? So president um, don't write and president who's the champ? Sure. There were definitely lots of presidents who who did not write. And, you know, it, it's a difficult question to answer how they compensated that because presidents just by the nature of the job did not produce as much prose for a long stretch of the presidency because for so much of that, you know, basically before Wilson and Roosevelt with wartime exceptions like Lincoln, the president was not the big story in Washington. If you were a reporter who wanted to cover what was really happening in the Capitol, you would go talk to, to Congress people and senators because that's where the action happened. And the president was, was really kind of an administrator. There's a great line in Woodrow Wilson's political science writing because he was a fantastic scholar before he ran for president where he compares the president to basically being like the administrator at a mid-tier railroad. And that, that wasn't a cheap shot. That was a fair description. So because presidents weren't always as influential in shaping the national vision, uh, they didn't need to compensate if they weren't talented with prose or, or prolific with prose because there, there wasn't a nation crying out for their prose necessarily. Um, but, you know, as we got into the, the modern presidency, I think what you would see is people like Johnson or somebody like uh, Nixon who would use recordings and ghostwriters and, and create records that way that then they would get help turning into a more traditionally literary product. So definitely with technology, things have changed, but I do think that a good writer is a good writer regardless of media. And the example I'm going to give here is actually Coolidge, because one of the documents that really elevated him to the national level and was reproduced in that book, Have Faith in Massachusetts, was a telegram that there was a strike in Massachusetts. I'm sure you all know the local history well, but you know he just grabbed a pencil and piece of paper and wrote a quick reply, but it was a very forceful reply, and it was a reply that resonated across the country. So that wasn't you know, a stately book, that was a telegram, but good writing can be good writing um, regardless of the medium. In terms of most prolific presidents, I, I could kick myself, but I never actually did a hard count because it's really hard to count books when you're dealing with somebody like Teddy Roosevelt because you know he would reissue books. And so if he writes a new introduction to a book, does that count as a whole other book or does that count as a quarter of a book? I'm not exactly sure, but I will tell you that the top two are Carter and Roosevelt. I suspect that Carter has more books than Roosevelt. Um, both of them uh, have written some really wonderful books. Um, Carter has a wonderful memoir of his boyhood growing up in Georgia that, that is so personal and, and is a lot like Coolidge's book, that sort of understated writing and really personal perspective. It's not about the White House. I wish I wish he had a book about the White House that had that same kind of tone, but it's, it's about his childhood and it's really powerful. Um, but some of his other books, I think, you know, people read more because they like Carter as a president than they like Carter as a, as a poet, for instance, he wrote, he's written some poetry. Um, Roosevelt, the same way. Uh, there, his first book is still studied by naval historians. I, I don't mean studied because uh, he was president. I mean, because it's an important account of the naval wars of 1812. And it's a really interesting book because it sort of does the opposite of what you would expect a Teddy Roosevelt book to do. It really undercuts ideas of ambition and patriotism and bluster. It's where everybody wanted to say Oliver Perry is the undisputed hero of the American side of, of 1812 and the naval conflicts. Roosevelt did the work. He crunched the numbers. He added up not just the cannons on the ships, which he would get by doing archival research at shipbuilders in, in Britain, but he would actually figure out, well, how many holes were in there were there in the ship so all the cannons could be pointed on one side because you know they might have how many cannons but how many actual cannons could they use that that's the kind of research he did and what his research led him to believe is that you know the fact that perry could be a charismatic figure or give a great speech or was really patriotic that didn't determine whether he won or lost it, it came down to more boring answers like who had the most guns who had the best ships who had the most people and so when Roosevelt was young and he actually started working on this book while he was at Harvard, he was willing to sort of, you know, try to understand structural causation and, and these kind of bigger forces that would determine who would win as much as a great leader would determine who would win. 
And yet the closer Roosevelt came to becoming a great leader himself, the more his books stopped being really thorough and really interesting and really provocative and started sort of just making everybody sound like Teddy Roosevelt, actually one of Roosevelt's contemporaries when he read Roosevelt's biography of Oliver Cromwell basically hinted, you know, this kind of just sounds like you're writing about yourself and using Cromwell's, uh, you know, scaffolding of his life story to tell that point. So the closer Roosevelt got to real power, the, the more he got in the mindset of just thinking, you know, leaders can change the world. And, and maybe that makes sense, because why would you do all the work to become president if you didn't think leaders could change the world? But when you look at Roosevelt's early books, and, and this is what I really focused on in my chapter, same thing with Wilson, too, in their early books, they're more understanding of the fact that there are historical forces that no one, not even a great president, can change. Um, that said, it, it makes sense that the closer you get to being president yourself, the more you would want to tell a story that says, hey, actually, people can change the world. Uh, I guess I think that, that the answer is probably falls somewhere in the middle, as it so often does with good history. It's probably some of both. Um, yeah. And I would, you, you've mentioned Jimmy Carter's An Hour Before Daylight as a wonderful, wonderful book. As a final question for me, and we are, we are wrapping up here, we've only got a couple more minutes. Um, if our viewers wanted to read some of what presidents have written, could you, could you give us one or two more um, recommendations, in addition, of course, to your own anthology of the best presidential writing, which gives us a sum of, some of almost everyone. Um, sure. any, any particular books you would wanna recommend? Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, hopefully my two books, the author in chief sort of tells the like the literary history and the behind the scenes stories and gives you the context. And then if you want to read more of what the presidents wrote themselves, I, I hope the anthology pairs nicely with it, because, you know, there's a little bit of Jefferson and it's some of the really interesting stuff Jefferson wrote, but also some of the stuff that he wrote about um, what, what he believed to be the degeneracy of black people. So I, it, it's not a, you know, it's best presidential writing, but it's not always perfect presidential writing. It tries to capture the good and the bad of American history, which, which I think is the only way to do it. Um, but, you know, in there, there's like, there are excerpts from Carter's book and other things, but there's also still real value in reading a, a full, you know, a, a full book. And, and I really like Coolidge's autobiography, which the Coolidge Presidential Library has brought back into print. It's a short book, and I'm always a fan of a short book because I can finish a short book and then feel really productive that day because I still have <laughs> that didactic American streak where I'm always trying to, to focus on self-improvement and, and finishing a book feels like a self-improving thing to do. So Coolidge's autobiography, I think, really stands up. Um, Grant's book is a classic for a reason, and it just captures in such a such an effective way. Again, with a lot of research, like I talked about with Roosevelt, the you know the the Civil War and his perspective on it. And Gr Grant's just such a terrific writer, and and I think he's a terrific writer actually because he read so much fiction. He was right there in that time period where reading fiction became more permissible, and he actually got demerits at West Point because he spent too much time in the library reading historical fiction, but it paid off for him. The joke, the joke's on Grant because he ended up writing such a, such a powerful and, and moving book. Um, other examples that I would point to, I actually really like the sort of kind of miscellaneous that come out after the presidential memoirs. Not, not every president has done this, but Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower both did this. They did the big presidential memoir that is kind of like the book that Obama put out, um, mm -hmm. the first volume of it. And both of their books are actually two volumes too, just like Obama's were. And those books have good passages. It's, I, I do think historians like to pick on presidential memoirs a little too much because they just take the best tidbits from them and then act like the whole books are, are a problem. But there are good moments even in presidential, even in turgid presidential memoirs. But, you know, some of them can be a real slog to read. And so the antidote to that, I think, would be a book like Eisenhower's At Ease, which is just kind of like these sort of, they're, they're somewhere between essays and interviews where he just is kind of talking about his personal life. Truman had a book called Mr. Citizen that I really like. And, you know, if you can't find a copy at a good library, you can go to archive.org and find an electronic copy of it. And in it, Truman just writes about things like, you know, now that I'm no longer president, what's my work like? Like, like, you know, I wake up, I talk to my wife, I read the newspaper, I get in this car that I really like, and I drive into downtown um, and go to work. And so just seeing him talk about that stuff, I think is really engaging. And he doesn't have that presidential pressure we were talking about with LBJ. He doesn't have any worry about appearing statesmanlike. He just opens up and kind of reveals his personality and, and his, his personal side. And so those books, Eisenhower's At Ease and Truman's Mr. Citizen, are two books that are not very well known anymore, but I think they're two of the most delightful ways to kind of get that personal side of, of the presidents that we've been talking about. That's wonderful. 
Craig, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you tonight about presidents and their books. Um, I'd like to thank you, Craig Fairman, for joining us, uh, to thank all of our viewers who've been watching. If you'd like to recommend this program to our friend, to friends, our public programs are available on the AAS YouTube channel. And I wanna put in a pitch for one more thing from the American Antiquarian Society. If you're itching for more on the presidents from AAS, please check out our blog, which is called Past is Present. There you'll find a new post today about Grover and Francis Cleveland, written by our graphic arts intern from this past summer, Sienna McCulley. We also encourage you to check out our upcoming programs, which are listed on the AAS website. Two weeks from this Thursday, on October 21st, we'll be presenting the 16th annual Robert C. Barron lecture by the historian James Merrill on his groundbreaking Bancroft prize winning book, The Indian's New World, Catawbas and Their Neighbors from European Contact Through the Era of Removal. The Barron lecture always features a scholar who's written a seminal work of history reflecting on the book's impact on scholarship in the years since its first appearance. The week after that, we have a program entitled Where Are the Birds? Rediscovering and Restoring the Landscapes of John James Audubon. And on November 1st, we'll host a conversation about the poet Phyllis Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, with Nina Dayton and Henry Louis Gates Jr. So stay tuned for more. Keep checking our website. Craig, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. And thank every, everyone for joining us tonight. I hope you all had some fun and have some good books to check out. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody and have a good evening.